On today's program, ICEJ Executive Director Donna Holbrook visits Canada Park in Israel. Reverend Adam Gabelli and Duran Kadar of Cry for Zion discuss how modern-day Jerusalem fulfills prophecy. And ICEJ Canada Arise directors Philippe and Marissa Bedard conclude their testimony. Between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem is Canada Park, and here is uh, Jessica to tell us why is it called Canada Park? Well, it's actually the Ayalon Canada Park, because we have the Ayalon Valley that comes through here as well. And towards the end of the 1960s, the Canadian community adopted this park, and you'll find that if you travel through Israel, there are various different parks that have been adopted by different countries. You'll find British Park, American Independence Park, and this was adopted by the Canadian community. And so since the beginning of the 1970s, this has been the mm. Ayalon Canada Park. Excellent. I understand that you have a John Deetha Baker road that runs through the park. He was one of our prime ministers. We do indeed. It starts from further up in the hills that come up towards, that go up towards Jerusalem and then lead down towards the edges of the park. So yes, we definitely, we have a, a strong Canadian connection here. You do. And the Jewish National Fund um, formed this um, this particular park and all the other parks, but you also maintain it on a regular basis, don't you? We do. We are we are the caretakers as well of open spaces. So we have different issues of intensive use and extensive use. So we, there are certain parts of Canada Park even which are for intensive use um, where we invite the public to come in and we also have extensive areas that we want to stay more natural as well for the future. So visitors that come, we have two tree planting centres in the country. There's one 10 minutes from here in Nachshon Forest, and there's one up at Golani Junction. Golani Junction, which we were just talking about, that's, that is where ICJ Canada has a grove of trees, yeah. and we can go there and plant. There's certain times of years, or uh, there's every seven years, that we do not plant. Can, would you like to tell us about the Shmita year? The Shnat Shmita, as you said, is yes. every seven years, with the idea being that the soil needs to rest. So every seven years, we let the soil rest, and we don't do the plantings, and we don't do the growing of, of, of agriculture, and we let the soil um, build, come, build, build itself build up, up again. again. It's a little bit like the Shabbat, isn't it, to the it week? Is indeed. <laughs> We're standing up here on one of the highest points of, of Canada Park. We're in the fortress of Hamat. Um, this is an ancient fortress that we've been working on, we've been doing excavation work on for the last two years. Um, we found that it, it, it goes around the whole of the top of the hill. It was a strategic point to control anything that was going up towards Jerusalem. Um, on top of it, we've, we've tried to sort of work out what kind of time frame we're talking about, starting from 140 BC, from the, the Maccabee time and going all the way up to through the Roman period and to the revolt to the revolt of Balkhova which was around 140 AD when we talk about the fortress uh, we've been doing 2 years of excavation intensive excavation here we know that there's a lot more down here we're talking we see different parts the the, the relics that we found go back towards the the the, um, the Maccabee times but we know that there's more under there and we're starting to find more and more and more as we go along as well. So we still have years of excavation ahead of us and we're hoping that with time we're going to try and solve the mystery of, of what was here even before those times as well. Zechariah 12 verses 3 through 5. On that day, when the nations of the earth are gathered against her, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock for all the nations. All who try to move it will injure themselves. On that day, I will strike every horse with panic and its riders with madness, declares the Lord. I will keep a watchful eye over Judah, and I will bind all the horses of the nations. Then the clans of Judah will say in their hearts, the people of Jerusalem are strong because the Lord Almighty is their God. So we're talking about prophecy fulfilled here in the Holy City. Uh, the Jewish view being that once it comes to pass, you are able to look ret retrospectively, hindsightly and say, this was what Zechariah was talking about. Mm -hmm. This is what Jeremiah was talking about. Tell us a little bit about this prophetic city. 
Mm. This holy city, but this prophetic city that is fulfilling prophecy today. Well, I think what's important to understand is the restoration of all things. Mm. Um, a lot of people have, you know, a lot of many wonderful, God-fearing, you know, Zionist Christians that were praying for Israel, that were excited about Israel being born again, uh, uh, getting our city back in 67 mm. and so on. There was a lot of excitement and hype going on in the right. world. Mm. But I think a lot of it was, again, you know, in, in ignorance to, to a certain extent, not realizing that the restoration is a process. Right. And we're actually right in the middle of the process. Mm. We haven't arrived yet. Mm. And I think many Christians are kind of watching these Bible prophecy teachers and whatever and, 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 and preaching, right? You know, you'll hear them preaching and it's exciting because first of all, it's a blessing for me as a Jew to see God-fearing Christians being supportive of Israel in right. contrast to so many who are not. Mm. So I'm not saying that we don't appreciate the support and all that, that's awesome. But what's important for me is to have context and to have revelation and understanding right. behind your zeal and your passion. Excellent, right, And so true. And I think that's kind of what's lacking in a lot of Christian Zionists uh, uh, um, in, in their outlook. The yeah, approach and, to Israel. Yes, and their tools, mm. right? If you have a toolbox, you know, you need to right, use the right tool for the right time for the right task. Correct. And when you don't have enough tools, right, et cetera, right, then, you know, the task can be a little bit hard and, and, and you'll find yourself a little frustrated. Mm. And I think many Christians, um, especially the older ones, are probably starting to question them and, and ask, so what's the whole point? Mm. You know, it's been so long since the founding of the yeah. state of Israel. 70 plus years. And... 50 plus years since Jerusalem Jerusalem being uh, restored to us right and very few are going well what about the Temple Mount mm. what about Judea Samaria right the, the heartland the biblical heartland the, absolutely the biblical heartland and so that's where I kind of come in and try to get Christians on board with let's understand the time that we're living in mm. let's look retrospectively to what the prophets prophesied and see how far have we gone Mm. Right? Then you kind of have a little bit of understanding of where you're going. If right. you don't know where you come from, you don't know where you're going. Correct. So we have to look back to where where we come from, how far are we in the redemption, right? And in the restoration process, mm -hmm. and how far yet do we have to go? Yes. Yeah. And that way we can not necessarily come up with predictions, but we can have a better understanding of what's the next mile marker, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it gives us excitement behind now this, yeah. now that. So you have something to work towards. Right. You're not just rejoicing over what has happened as, you know, either, right? You're, right. you're also looking towards what's the an next mile marker. greater restoration and even greater fulfillment. Yes. So the ultimate fulfillment and restoration th that I understand is when all of Judea and Samaria is completely restored under Jewish sovereignty mm. and the Temple Mount. Yeah, so important because that is the key. That's the center. Because that's the very heart of it, exactly. Mm. And so Judea and Samaria, and here's and here's the question: Is many of your viewers are saying, "Well, why?" Mm. Well, number one, you don't understand what Judea and Samaria is. Mm. You've only heard it in the in the media's term, in the uh, anti-Israel term, right. which is occupied territories, West Bank, or West Bank. Yeah, which both terms are not true. Yep. On the one hand, it is true. It's under is Islamic Palestinian occupation. Yeah, I agree. If there's an occupation, that's the one that there is. Mm. In other words, there are the, and what is Palestinian, by the way? From Philistine. From Plishtim, which yes. is? The, the Philistines of old. That was just a renaming by yes. the emperor uh, Hadrian, I believe yep. it was, because yep. he was just so fed up with, with the Jews that were here, he wanted yep. to just stick it to them. Yeah, and here's the irony. So the, 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 the original Philistines in the Bible who are no longer a people group or are alive anymore, yeah. but those, that people group, first of all, they're, they're Phoenicians. Yep. They weren't from here. And we called them Plishtim, a Hebrew term and label, yeah. not a people group, meaning the invaders. A foreigner, right, the invader. The invader, mm. the invader. In other words, they came and they invaded what was not theirs. Mm. Ironically, <laughs> the Palestinians of today who can't even say the word Palestinian because P is not within the Arab vocabulary, yes. so they can't say P 
Palestinian. They say, they call themselves Palestinian. Yeah. Or, Ironically. Or Philistine. They, no, they won't they, say Philistine. They, they won't use that term because they don't they don't see uh, that connection. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So ironically, right, the people who claim a heritage to this land, first of all, use a fictitious name, hmm. and they use a name which I think is very proper for them because they are falsely here. They're invading what's not theirs. Yeah. They're originally Arabs, which are from original tribal people groups who live within the whole of the Middle East surrounding us. Right, and so, they settled in this area. So, and they came because of Jewish entrepreneurship because mm. the land was desolate. Right. So if you read Mark Twain, as he came to this beautiful city that you see mm. behind us right now that looks amazing, when he was here, this was not the Jerusalem he saw. Yeah. He saw the dead, desolate Jerusalem because the Jewish inhabitants was not in the land. Yes. Therefore, the blessing of God wasn't in the land. Mm. When the Jewish people came back after almost 2,000 years of desolation and other nations trying to do something with this land and getting pretty much nowhere, we came along. We came back just as the prophets prophesied. And just as the prophets prophesied, when you put your hand to the land, it will come back to life. Life came, absolutely. So within the conflict that's happening today, you need to understand, A, there's a spiritual battle going on mm. for the land. Mm. It doesn't matter if it's Palestinian, if it's German Nazis, or if it's communist Russia or China. Mm. At the end of the day, the enemies are irrelevant. What's relevant is understanding, A, whose land is it? What is prophesied to take place here? If you're a Bible-believing Christian. Yeah. And you being on the right side of history. Mm. So if you, are as a Bible-believing Christian, believe that it's a Bible-thumping Zionist fanatics who are on board with Israel, then you're wrong. Right. You're simply wrong. Yeah, it's not it Bible-thumping, yeah. ignorant, Christian Zionists slash Jewish Zionists who are on the wrong side of history. It's the ones who don't understand whose land it is right. and what is what God is trying to do here. Right. The conflict is just it's just it's just a it's just a, a um, how to say it, it, like like in a, in a magic trick. It's diversion mm. from the real thing what, that's really the happening. The real issue, the real core of it. And so that's what we're talking about today. Awesome. Is we're talking about the core. Awesome. Awesome, thank you, Daron. Psalm 147, verses one through seven. Praise the Lord, how good it is to sing praises to our God, how pleasant and fitting to praise Him. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars and calls them each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. The Lord sustains the humble, but casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with grateful praise. Make music to our God on the harp. Well, I'm back here with uh, Marissa and Phil from Montreal, La Belle Provence from Quebec. Uh, you guys are also our reps in, in Quebec. And so it's really awesome that uh, we can have you with us here today. Uh, what I want to talk to you guys a little bit about, because I, again, I know in previous conversations, we've talked about this, that when you went to Israel twice now, uh, that you would have conversations with people, coworkers, people around you, and they would, they'd be asking you, Marissa, Phil, why are you going? Aren't you afraid? Isn't there war there? Um, maybe, Marissa, let us know. You were there in 2014. That was your first trip. Yeah. And that was, you were actually literally there the summer of Protective Edge, the first uh, Gaza, basically, big war. Uh, and it was, it was a really tense yeah. time, but you were there. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that experience for you. Sure. So prior to going um, to leave, uh, leaving for Israel, I had a lot of people who were against the idea. Mm -hmm. um, specifically, even just family members, even people in my church, not because of anything against Israel or anything, but just for, but just for, for safety. my safety, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I really felt strong in my heart that I needed to go, and mm -hmm. the Lord was really prompting me, and He's like, yes, you still need to go. I will protect you. I will protect the team. I am protecting Israel. Amen. Israel is the apple of my eye. I will Amen. always protect yeah. and keep Israel safe. 
Um, so I was kind of expecting a little bit more of like this feeling of hustle and bustle and like anxiety in the atmosphere, but I actually felt a lot of peace when I arrived. Awesome. Um, it was surprising. It was really quiet. There was no other tourists around. We were the only tourists, so the perks of that was everyone was very, very excited to see us and right. happy that we were there. Right, as we a blessing. Got, exactly. Sure. We were asked a lot, like, why are you here at this time? They found it really strange. Mm. But it did give us the opportunity to share more about ICJ in a Great. very just, like, casual way. And that was exciting because I, th I think it did bring comfort to them um, to see us there and supporting Israel, even though it was a time of, like, war. And well, yeah, you know, likewise, I, I've been to, to Israel many times, seven times, in fact, and you know, I've never really felt in danger for my safety. Mm -hmm. um, you know, of course, we're always keeping your eyes open. It's, it, like if you're in any city in Europe or in a large city in the United States, and even in Montreal, you know, you're not going to be walking down the streets of Montreal without realizing, hey, you know what? There are strangers here. There's different people here. But one thing I do know about Israel is that people are really outgoing and friendly. Uh, and, and so, again, that's one thing I do love about it. How about you, Phil? What was your thought? I know, again, you told me personally that you were, you were having people almost harassing you, friends, harassing you online, saying, what are you doing? Yeah. Go in there. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, coming pretty much like uh, coming from a background of non-Christian uh, family, non-Christian friends, um, I would say that I had a lot of people like before I went, I had a lot of misunderstanding people that were like, why, why would you go to Israel? Like, this is a, this is a war zone. And, uh, why do you even support Israel? Because people have this misconception that Israel is the big, like Middle East persecutor mm. while it's actually the opposite. Right. Um, I would say I got a lot of people online when I was posting things about because the first time we went was actually a, a little bit of a, a mess uh, at some at some point because there was like a lot of, of bombings coming from Gaza. Yeah, uh, rockets yeah like the southern district. Yeah. Exactly. Even like in the northern district, like Syria sent like a couple drones within Israel. We've even uh, heard the Iron Dome uh, sh that shot one of the drones. So my first experience, like in terms of security in Israel, I was not afraid because I felt very like I, you feel really secure there. Yeah, uh, you feel very peaceful there. It, the, even if it's a war zone, it doesn't feel like uh, you're going to turn the corner of a street and something's going to blow up your face. You don't feel like that. You actually feel very peaceful. Uh, mm. You feel like people are kind, people are welcoming. And uh, I was actually quite surprised the first time I went to Israel to see um Israelis and uh, and Palestinians actually living together, uh, right. which I thought was not the case. I thought that like there was only Israelis in Israel, and that uh, Palestinians were staying either in the Gaza uh, the Gaza Strip or uh, within the West Bank, which I thought. Uh, for a long time, but now I saw like that. Uh, no, there there are some there are some Palestinians and there are some Israelis, and they live together. And there is like nothing really dramatic going on. I mean, like of course sometimes there's gonna happen. There's gonna be some stuff happening, right. but right. Uh, it's not like something that you will see every day. So, well, you know, I I, I totally agree, Phil. I, that was a big shock for me when when I first went. I, I remember first going at 14 years old. And uh, I think even at that time, there was, you know, they had just come out of the second intifada and uh, there was, there was stress. There was uh, people saying, you know, I mean, even our, in our church saying, you know, I'm not going to go because I'm just worried. But it was just amazing to go and see. And you're right. They live side by side, especially in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. you know, walking on the streets of Jerusalem. I remember having an amazing shawarma. One of the best shawarmas is actually just outside of uh, uh, Damascus Gate. Mm -hmm. And uh, sitting outside in Damascus Gate, there you have a Israeli Jew and uh, an Arab with his with his very Arab garb, having a, a coffee together and laughing, you know? And, and, and that's the reality that people around the world don't see. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't see the fact that um, th there's just a lot of antagonism that's put on e either side. Somebody's a victim, somebody's an oppressor. Mm -hmm. But the truth is they're just trying to live a life together, uh, the majority of them. So that we have to continue to pray. What can you say um, 
maybe uh, Phil and then Marissa, to any young adult who's, who maybe might have this worry on the back of their minds, you know, I I'm, I'm, would love to go to Israel, but I'm just worried about stuff. What, what is one piece of advice you could give them? Well, first of all, we both went twice and we're still alive. So yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> no injuries, nothing. So everything is, it's not not secure to go to Israel. I mean, of course, when we go with the Arise Tour, we don't go in places where we know uh, that it could be dangerous. We try to stay away from those places, right, of course. We'll never put anybody in yeah, harm's way. Because the, the yeah. goal of ICEJ and the Arise Tour is not to put anybody in danger. It's actually to, 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 to bring them in the land of Israel, experience the land, but not be afraid or traumatized by it. Right. Um, Which has never happened, by the way, on record. Exactly. Yeah, it never happened. Everyone's been left. Uh, left. Everyone's left the place with joy and Exactly. To go back. Exactly. And my piece of advice would be just like, have faith like if yeah. god is calling you to go visit israel if god is calling you to uh to, to take a stand for israel uh, to inform yourself uh, to actually not listen to the western media because it's very corrupt on the subject but mm -hmm. to actually to dig to dig for information dig for the truth right. and just seek to understand the situation uh, more than what you can just see uh in the in the western public media right. is a very good thing to start with and then after you might have this passion for israel that will grow inside of your heart and you will see that going to israel is not like supporting like an apartheid state or something Absolutely like that not. because it is actually quite the opposite right so I would just say have faith, uh, get informed, and, uh, and, and just go. Great, great. Marissa? Yeah. yeah, similar to what Phil is saying, have faith, trust what God is telling mm -hmm. you. If you feel like he's really put on your heart to go to Israel, go. Yeah. He's going to protect you. He's going to take care of you. He will bring you the revelation that you've been looking for. Like, go in faith and step out and trust that, um, yeah, that you will be good. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah, friends, you won't regret it. Going to Israel is is definitely a life-changing event. Um, I, I like to say it's not going to it's not going to define your faith in the way of whether you uh, spend eternity with God or not. No, not at all. But it will enhance and enrich your faith in your walk with the Lord. So thank you so much, guys, for joining me today. There are many ways in which we bring comfort to Israel, and I want to share with you two significant ways we assist Israel in crisis through Operation Life Shield and Christian Friends of Megid David Adam. Since Israel's birth as a modern nation, she has had to be on guard against attacks on all sides. She is a nation not even the geographical size of Vancouver Island, so it's difficult for us as Canadians to understand the variety and range of aggression Israel faces daily. These maps show the level of threat Israel is under 24-7, principally from Hamas in the south, Hezbollah to the north. Both are terrorist entities with rockets targeting communities in Israel. Rabbi Shmuel Bowman, executive director of Operation Life Shield, and his wife Leah have become very close friends of ours over the past decade. Shmuel was born in Toronto, Canada, has worked tirelessly with partners like ICJ to provide now over 100 bombproof shelters throughout Israel to protect children at schools, youth centers, bus stops, and families at home. 12 to 15 seconds only to find safety after an alarm sounds in the south. These bomb shelters have been strategically placed and many are dedicated in the memory of families and faithful ICJ donor friends. Magid David Adam, MDA, is Israel's National Emergency Pre-Hospital Medical Blood Services and Disaster Relief Organization based in Jerusalem. Christian Friends Division of MDA was founded as a practical way for Christians to contribute to these first responders to everyone in Israel regardless of their faith or ethnicity. MDA call centers respond to over 100,000 calls each day, has over 26,000 volunteers, and can test over 150,000 people for coronavirus in one week. Major kudos to our donor friends from Manitoba, Canada who through their hearts and companies save lives daily with an ambulance in Sfat, a Medi scooter in Tel Aviv, and an intensive ambulance station in Beth Shemesh. 
Ambulances donated have their names inscribed on the doors, so when it drives by, every Israeli can see that Christian friends of MDA are doing something practical as well as praying. Canadian friends of MDA donated an ambulance in Jerusalem in honor of our friends and ICJ co-founders Merva Merla Watson. In Judaism, there is a saying that he who saves one life saves the entire world. Judaism cherishes human life, and we do too. Thank you. We conclude our program today with some sights and sounds within Israel. Thank you for joining us today, and be sure to visit our website at www.icejcanada.tv or call us at 1-866-324-9133. And for our Canadian residents, be sure to ask for your free Canada-Israel pin. Through your contributions to ICEJ Canada, you can participate by giving to Haifa Home for Holocaust Survivors, Women at Risk Red Carpet Project, Operation Life Shield Bomb Proof Shelters, Mentoring Programs Alia Support, Children's Projects, Israel in Crisis, Israel Aid, Agan David Adam Emergency Services, Christian Friends of Yad Vashem, Scholarships for Young Adult Leaders, ICEJ Canada Media Fund, Gift Estate Securities Fund.